Hello and welcome to CBS News Miami Juneteenth special. I'm Naja Sherman. The holiday is often seen as the longest running emancipation celebration, but the truth is that there are many dates observed throughout the South. While Juneteenth marks the day when people who were enslaved in Texas learned of their freedom, the story of emancipation in Florida is older and more complex. To learn more about the history of emancipation in Florida, I met with Dr. Tamika Hobbs. She's a historian, educator, author, and activist. She currently serves as the regional manager of Broward County's African American Research Library and Cultural Center in Fort Lauderdale. You can begin when Abraham Lincoln signed the Emancipation Proclamation and it went into effect on January 1st, 1863. Those people who had been enslaved in areas that were under federal control were freed immediately. And so that applied not only to parts of Florida, Key West specifically and in East Florida, but in many places along the South Carolina coast. That means Florida's tradition of observing emancipation predates what we celebrate with Juneteenth by at least two years. The 20th of May has been observed as Florida's Emancipation Day in communities across Florida for nearly 160 years, as the day the majority of Florida's enslaved population was freed. The history is explored in Dr. Hobbs' newly released documentary called Before Juneteenth, Florida's Emancipations. I just think it's so important that this particular history does not get um, eclipsed with some of the today fanfare or hype that's going on as it relates to emancipation. The observance, the historical date of May 20th, 1865, which is Emancipation Day, is what I grew up and others like me grew up knowing it as is the date when African Americans enslaved in Florida were free from slavery. Florida historians say it's very important to preserve the history and events that took place in our state, especially the celebrations and tradition keepers who invested their time and energy to make sure May 20th was a festive occasion each year. A lot of hearing about it came about because of Juneteenth, as Juneteenth became um, more popular and began to be observed more in different places around the country, uh, that's when you started hearing more that, well, you know, that was Texas. What about our story here in, in, in Florida? This was a very profound experience and something not to be brushed aside and something not to just be a footnote in history. Dr. Hobbs says all these holidays together, the 20th of May, Juneteenth, and 4th of July together, all have a very important place in helping tell our national history that not everyone in American democracy was free at the same point, and our journey to freedom was much more complicated. On the morning of June 19th, hundreds of people lined the streets of Hollywood for the annual Juneteenth South Broward Parade. I found out from the event creator, bringing the parade to fruition took resilience, tenacity, and a love for the community. At the Juneteenth South Broward Parade, you can expect music, dancing, and a great marching band. Juneteenth South Broward founder Georgette Lasley told me she developed the celebration after discovering a need in her community. At the time, she owned a small cafe in Liberia. As she greeted customers one year on Juneteenth, she was surprised by their reaction. Bringing her vision to reality faced obstacles. She told me initially she was turned down by several municipalities. So knowing that I lived this firsthand is something, you know? So that's why celebration of freedom, celebration of me being who I am, 
that means a lot to me. Georgette began attending the City of Hollywood meetings, making her case for the event. Hollywood city leaders said yes. They was the only ones that opened the door for me to do it. And the Juneteenth South Broward Parade was born. Each year, Georgette, we persist. You push that pebble until it's a stone, and then it becomes a rock, and then it becomes a boulder, until it becomes a mountain of support for making sure that we can fight back against discriminatory conduct, laws, and oppression. We started out from like a, a one to 200 people throughout the first five years to my, seven, to my seventh year is when it grew and it was just so phenomenal. Now, eight years later, hundreds line the streets of Hollywood for the annual celebration of freedom and the end of slavery in the United States. When we come back, we take an up-close look at the unique role that Key West played in how slaves found their freedom. That's next. Thank you for joining us for our Juneteenth special. I'm Naja Sherman. Juneteenth became a federal holiday in 2021. It's a day when the nation commemorates the ending of slavery and freedom for African Americans. After Juneteenth, Jim Crow laws and the Ku Klux Klan came to intimidate and oppress free black people, including right here in Miami. CBS News Miami's Tanya Francois shares a remnant of those times still being kept and preserved. Juneteenth is about being free of racial intimidation. Geographically, South Florida is in the South. In the early 1900s, segregation and racial oppression was a way of life. The Klan burned crosses right here in Miami, and we found one of them. We have those things as a, not necessarily to constantly um, thrive or, 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 or ruminate on those negative aspects of the past, but to serve as a reminder that these things actually happen, that this is a part of our history. Seeing it takes your breath away. The decades old cross is stored in Overtown at the Lyric Theater and is a part of the black archives. It's small, but its message still very clear. Camilla Pritchett is the executive director. The cross that we have was because there was a black person invited to a church. I'm wearing a glove to protect the cross from the natural oils that are on my hand. At 75 years old, if you touch it, the soot still wears off. In 1939, just before an election day, crosses were used by the Ku Klux Klan to scare black voters. Back then, Overtown was called Color Town. Nadege Green is the founder of Black Miami Dade. So the Miami Klan came out the day before Election Day with a parade of cars through Overtown. They burned 25 crosses at all of the major intersections of Overtown. A cross was placed, set on fire. Life magazine covered that Klan rally. It published pictures of what Miami looked like then. The poll tax has been lifted. And that terrified the white power structure in Miami because all of a sudden now you have all of these black voters who can go out and vote. There weren't just cross burnings, dummies hung from poles and there are pictures of nooses dangling from cars. The terror didn't work. More than a thousand black people still showed up and voted. Life magazine noted it was the biggest turnout in Miami election year history. You may call out the Klan, but you must have forgot that a Negro is a man. The movement so powerful, the Langston Hughes wrote a poem about Miami called The Ballad of Sam Solomon. It was down in Miami a few years ago. Negroes never voted, but Sam said it's time to go to the polls election day and make your choice known. The entire poem is on our website. You can go to CBSMiami.com to read it. At the Lyric Theater, Tanya Francois, CBS News, Miami. As we continue to celebrate Juneteenth, we take an up-close look at the unique role Key West played and how the slaves were freed there. It was long before the end of the Civil War. Here's CBS News Miami's Hank Tester. Things have always been a little different in Key West. Independent attitudes, tolerance. Yet, little known is Key West's connection to Abraham Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation. The whole Emancipation Saga here in Key West, I, there's, I don't think there's anything else like it. Historian Gene Tenney. Despite the fact that the state of Florida had seceded, 
Key West had remained under uh, Union control. And that's the key to this story. A map of the Confederacy, the 13 rebel states, a closer look at Florida, Tallahassee, the state capital of the Confederate states of Florida, Key West, hundreds of miles to the south and west, firmly in Union hands. Why? The the Keys were uh, crucial for the Union because they they guarded the entrance to the Gulf of Mexico. Thus, the Union's construction of Fort Jefferson and Fort Zachary Taylor were built in part with slave labor. Slaves from Key West rented out to the U.S. government. It was all about business. The main thing was being able to rent these folks out, uh, as as was done, as as you noted, for building you know, uh, Fort Jefferson. President Abraham Lincoln issued the Emancipation Proclamation on January 1, 1863, declaring that all slaves held in all Confederate states be set free. Key West slaves gained their freedom a short 18 days later, well before the slaves in other rebel states, because Florida was a Confederate state, yet in Key West, the Union Army was in charge. The enslaved people in Key West were pretty happy. A celebration led by freed Key West slave Sandy Cornish. Key West slave owners not happy. The people were pelted with stones. Uh, You know, dirty water was poured on the head of the, well, uh, some of the people are on the flag bearer. The the flag bearer had the flag snatched from him and the, the staff broken over his head. But the big picture? In Key West, attitudes were a bit different as over the years, black and whites got along pretty well. When you have folk isolated on an island who have to survive together, uh, it's probably a fair guess that no matter what their status is on on paper, that there there would have to have been just a lot more understanding and cooperation going on. I'm Hank Tester, CBS News, Miami. Thank you so much for joining us. For more on our comprehensive look at Juneteenth, just go to our website, cbsmiami.com. You can find us streaming 24-7 on Pluto TV and the CBS app. We hope you have a great rest of your day.